Welcome everyone. My name is Josh Prywess. On behalf of everyone at Westchester Children's Association, I want to thank you for joining us as we bring the recent documentary Push Out, The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools, to Westchester for a conversation about school discipline across the county. The documentary sheds light on school policies, practices, and cultural norms that adultify girls of color and further worsen the school to prison pipeline. Highlighting this documentary and having discussions about how it hits home are crucial as we fight for race equity so all children are healthy, safe, and prepared for life's challenges. Westchester Children's Associations work with the Solutions Not Suspensions and Raise the Age New York coalitions allow us to directly combat the school to prison pipeline. We are joined by three distinguished Westchester leaders who are also working to combat the school to prison pipeline. We are so proud to have with us Dr. Tahira Dupree Chase, Superintendent of Greenberg Central School District, Michelle Nicholas, Executive Director of Girls Inc. of Westchester, and Stephanie Shabman, Legal Director of Student Advocacy. Let's give you each a moment to introduce yourselves and your role, starting with Dr. Chase and followed by Michelle and Stephanie. Greetings audience, my name is Dr. Tahira Dupree Chase and I am the very proud superintendent of the Greenberg Central School District in Hartsdale, New York. I thank you so much and I thank the Westchester Children's Association for inviting me to have this important discussion on the post-COVID era and identifying our students' needs and also identifying healthy solutions for our students when they do come back and particularly our girls. I am a 26-year educator and I never believe that I am too experienced to learn. And so I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists as we begin to make a new normal for our schools in terms of dealing with student discipline. So again, thank you so much for having me as part of this panel. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, my name is Michelle A. Nicholas, and I'm the Executive Director of Girls Inc. of Westchester County, an organization that is focused on inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Being honored to be present today is it's just unbelievable, and, and words can't begin to express the privilege that we have just to, to be with each other during this pandemic, during this time. We know for a fact that the conversation on discipline, the conversation on what is happening with our girls today, with our, with our students, with our young people today is one that needs to be had because the reality is, is that every day they are being impacted. They are dealing with so many issues, some of which we have not been even able to fathom. So at this time, I'm looking forward to working and speaking with our distinguished panelists, as well as the Westchester Children's Association, as they're putting together ways that we can work together at the end of the day. The reality is, is that we want to do whatever it takes to ensure that our young people be the future leaders they need to be, that they want to be. And we're so grateful to be here today. So I'm looking forward to having the conversation and doing whatever it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Stephanie? Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Chapman, and I'm the legal director at Student Advocacy. Student Advocacy is a legally based nonprofit educational advocacy agency. We serve children in Westchester and Putnam counties, and the students range from age three to 21. We represent children who are struggling with educational issues in public schools. Our services range from providing technical assistance to professionals such as therapists and caseworkers, probation officers, and of course to parents, as well as direct representation of children and their families regarding registration, residency, special education, and of course suspension matters. In my 10 years at Student Advocacy, I have personally represented numerous children, even as young as kindergarten, who are facing out-of-school suspensions. Much has been written over the recent years about the lasting, deleterious impact suspensions have on children. This punitive approach to discipline not only disengages students from school and therefore learning, but also teaches children how not to go to school. This is the very beginning of the well-documented school-to-prison pipeline. I would invite you all to please see student advocacy's important white paper entitled Solutions Not Suspensions, which examines the deleterious impact suspensions has on all students in Westchester and the heartbreaking but not surprising data that shows that students of color are disproportionately and disparately treated under this traditional suspension model, especially black girls, which brings us to this very important conversation. I'm honored to be on this panel and to have this discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to start with the landscape of school discipline in Westchester, followed by education engagement after and during COVID-19. 
and school discipline solutions for Westchester. Let's start with Stephanie to discuss the school discipline landscape across Westchester for girls of color. Just a brief note of caution that nothing in my presentation should be construed as legal advice. Please consult with an education attorney before relying on the information contained therein and that the portion of student advocacy's presentation cannot be reproduced without express permission of student advocacy. So thank you for understanding that. So now I'm going to jump right into the data, which will really crystallize the situation about girls of color and out of school suspension. So this is a slide from OCR, and it's a snapshot. It's from 2011-2012 data, which shows us that black boys are the only group of students who are suspended more than black girls. What this means is black girls are suspended more than any other girl or any other boy other than black boys in school nationally. It's interesting to note that on this slide, New York suspension rates overall are surprisingly less than other states. Now I'm gonna bring it into Westchester, which is something that we're much more familiar with. And this data clearly shows that there are about 74% of Black and Latina ex-girls suspended compared to 16% of white girls. And what I think is also very important to note, these are statistics that show that girls who are actually suspended. But what about all the girls that have what we call soft suspensions or off the record suspensions when um, girls are sent home? or parents are asked to pick up their girls. There isn't even a recording of this kind of information because there's no way to, um, to record it. But I think it's very important that this number is probably greater than is represented here. And how do I know that? I know that because student advocacy represents many children in suspension situations. And I'm going to jump to my, my slide about student advocacy suspension data, which is the most current because it's the slide that I can, um, can produce the data on. And what this slide shows clearly connects to something that I felt was a very powerful and sad part of the movie that the criminalization of victimization is what we're seeing of these very young girls. Girls are reacting because their voices are not heard or their needs are not addressed in the school situation. So the student advocacy data from 2017, 2018, and 2019, which is a three-year period, and these are only students that we actually worked with. So there could be many, many other students out there in Westchester who I can't report on because they haven't reached out to student advocacy. Overall, we worked with 42 suspended girls. Black and brown girls had the highest rates of suspension. Out of a three-year period of the girls we advocated for, 42 black girls were suspended versus one white girl. So you will see that the only white girl that we represented in 2017 was the only one that we know of that was suspended in the schools. So these numbers alone speak volumes as to the disproportionality of the suspension of black and brown girls in Westchester schools. What kinds of interventions does Greenberg use to combat the criminalization of girls of color? Wow, you know, listening to the statistics that Stephanie gave, you know, it just really puts in perspective the importance of making sure that there are interventions in place to avoid the criminalization of girls of color. You know, I think of what we're doing in Greenberg Central School District. For one, we are starting mentorship programs and we're starting this at different age groups. I'll give you a case in point. At one of my elementary schools, Richard J. Bailey Elementary School, um, and that houses grades four through six, the sixth grade girls girls actually have a joint mentorship program where they are teamed up with different female teachers in the building to serve as mentors to them or the person that they can actually come to. Um, what we're doing more and more is that we're learning about the different behaviors of girls and learning how to deal with those behaviors and not penalize girls for certain behaviors, but understand what they're really trying to tell us by acting a certain way. Even at our high school, we have a mentorship. 
I've actually been very instrumental in that mentorship. I participate with the young ladies. Many of them are probably here on our forum because they were invited to be a part of the forum. And we do things with the girls. We take them out of the district. We take them out. We, we talk to them about self-care. We talk to them about self-love and hoping to mitigate against some of those behaviors that will be deemed as misbehaviors that would lead to disciplinary action. And we try to turn that into some positive behaviors where the girls are helping one another. Or if they do cross the line as it relates to our code of conduct, that we handle it differently where they will go to someone in the building whom they believe they can trust and they could speak to that person before the behavior levels to a point where we would have to take discipline action. So we're putting tier models in place for our girls to give them an outlet so that they can express themselves differently to avoid having to suspend these young ladies or to criminalize the behaviors that they display. Thank you. That sounds a lot like what we saw in the film Push Out in terms of- Of course it does. <laughs> and that's so great to hear that in Greenberg and in Westchester, that's being done. My other question for you is in terms of school climate, how important do you see school climate in relation to discipline? And then what kinds of best practices are implemented in Greenberg? Sure. Well, you know, Josh, during this whole COVID-19 era that we're in since March, I think people are learning and realizing more and more that school is more than a place where students learn, where students are fed. School is the place where students feel safe. School is a place where students are welcome and students are loved. And we're recognizing the importance of schools because so many kids are longing to go back to the schools. And quiet is kept. Some of the parents cannot wait for their kids to go back to school because they know this is a safe place for children. Having a safe place really speaks a lot to school culture and school climate, right? So you want to create a climate where kids feel safe to express themselves. You want to create a climate where kids feel safe to speak to a caring adult about what they're feeling or any sort of trauma that they may be experiencing. So it's important that students know that that exists. It also is important that culture is welcoming. The culture is acceptance of diversity and the different needs of our students. And more importantly, the different needs, of especially of our girls, because our girls, as Stephanie indicated earlier, you notice that the statistics of girls getting involved in negative behavior has definitely increased. And so many schools, such as Greenberg Central School District schools, are working to mitigate some of those data points because it is absolutely absolutely disturbing to see this. Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, and it's so great to see that that's your priority as superintendent in terms of working to provide that environment where students and girls in particular can feel comfortable speaking about what's going on in their lives, but also have that safety to really speak to an adult, or have that support system. So I'm happy to hear that. And thank you for all of your work in making that happen. There's an expectation that kids should respond the way adults do, and they just don't. They are children. And so when these young ladies express themselves in what most would deem as negative behaviors, I think that we should be well-trained enough to recognize that this young lady is calling out for something else. She might need something else, or maybe she's telling us something. Maybe the reason why she's loud and expressive or want to fight other girls is because maybe at home she has to fight. Maybe she has to fight for various reasons. We don't know. But we shouldn't always look at it as negative. I think we should look at it as a way in which that some students are wired to communicate and try to break down those barriers to really see what it is that they're saying to us and then get them the support and the help they need. That is really very positive and inclusive and trauma-informed and really follows all of the best practices that I've been hearing and seeing, especially in push out, but also in terms of Westchester experts of schools and the county department of mental health. So I'm very happy to hear that. And I want to congratulate and thank you for making that happen. And that lens being applied to your work at the school district. So Michelle, as an out of school program, please talk to the concerns that you're hearing from school districts and what you're doing to address those needs of students, especially girls of color in relation to school discipline. Well, thank you so much for that question. The interesting part of that question is you mentioned, you know, out of school, after school programming. And, you know, it's really always surprising to me that the service that we provide is categorized as after school, you know, the reality is, is that we are providing a safe space for girls to come and express themselves, define themselves and be themselves in, in an environment where sometimes it's very, very hard. We know that a lot of our girls that are coming to us, we don't know what's happening before they walk into the school program. Sometimes we don't know what has happened during the day. So when they come to us, 
and they are sharing and expressing themselves and just being themselves. One of the things that we love to do is listen, right? We are spending a lot of our time listening to them. There is no judgment. There is no need for judgment. We know that they are experiencing so much and we spend a lot of time listening to them so that we can work with them to find recognized needed solutions because we know of the importance of having those things done. You know, we work with several school districts throughout Westchester County and Girls Inc. is an international organization that's been around for almost 160 years. The affiliate Girls Inc. Westchester has been around for 13 years. And with the school districts that we work with in Westchester County, you know, we find that we have opportunities for partnership, right? We are partnering with the superintendents. We are partnering with the principal, the teachers. And one of our key partners are the guidance counselors because they help us to navigate. They help us to understand some of the things that's going on. But I have to be very real and honest with you as we are building those relationships with some of our partners, we do see that sometimes some of our partners come and say, well, these are the girls that we would love to have in your program. These are the girls that have been suspended. These are the girls that, that uh, fall into that discipline bracket. And so, you know, we're often confused by that because Girls Inc. is a voluntary program. It is a relationship and a partnership with Girls Inc., a relationship and partnership with the girl and her parent, her guardian. So when an official makes the decision to say, hey, we are just going to put in the, the girls that are suspended in your program, if that, that doesn't make any sense because in a lot of ways, you are really not listening to the girls, right? And so we spend a lot of time working with our girls on self-esteem and self-confidence and, and conflict resolution because those are the things that they need. When the girls come into us, some of the things we might hear from some of our partners that, you know, the girl has been struggling, she's not getting her schoolwork done, etc. To be very frank with you, when we speak with the girls, you hear things like, well, we don't have Wi-Fi in the house, or there are no computers in the house, or I have to take care of my younger siblings, or mom is not at home at all, or mom's boyfriend is, you know, impacted, trying to get into my room on a constant basis, and mom is not listening to me. So all of these pieces brings us back to one of the most important things that I have found, which is the listening component. We need to pay attention to what our girls are saying, what our girls of color are saying. We know that, as Stephanie had mentioned a bit earlier, talking about the percentage. The Girls Inc. Westchester actually works with the underserved and underrepresented population. Our girls right now, it's 99% are girls of color. So we know that they're being impacted on a daily basis. We know that they're faced with so much. And all we need to do is pay attention. We need to listen. We need to provide opportunities like mentorships. All of our girls have mentors that can get them through the daily path. And we also provide opportunities for them to do so much more. So for me, the building of the relationship with the school district and the reality of them understanding that, there's so much that's happening before the girls even touch the schools in the morning. There's so much that's happening during that day. And we need to work as partners to ensure that our girls are taken care of because these girls are coming in with so much. We have to do the part to help them provide those opportunities and resources that can ultimately help them find the necessary and needed solutions. Thank you. That was wonderful and, and very informative, Michelle. Thank you. Are there any school discipline policies that you're seeing from your perspective that if they were changed would allow you to actually better serve the girls that Girls Inc. Westchester currently works with? Absolutely. So, you know, I am a firm believer that before we click that suspension button or we think about suspension, I really would prefer there to be a collective conversation. I am not into suspensions. There's so much that's happening. There's so many other things that we could do to help these girls. And so, you know, the reality of, can we put suspension like all the way over there? Let suspension take a time out. Mm -hmm. and Let's deal with the real issues 
right? Let's suspend those real issues, right? Let's deal with that. Let's get that done. Let's focus on that because that's what's really impacting these girls to get from point A to point B. We know that poverty is a conversation that needs to be had. A lot of our girls are girls that their families fall within that poverty line. So they may not have all of the tools, all of the things that they need. So we need to put suspension on the wayside, all the way to the back, the back of the class room, maybe even the back of the school, and let's deal with the real issues, things that are really impacting the girls, and talk about it. Talk about it honestly and openly, because we know, unfortunately, that some of the conversations, some of the ways that girls are, I mean, I'm a woman of color, and so sometimes if I look a particular way, I might be seen as being aggressive. Um, that's not necessarily true. I might just not want to say anything to you today. I might just have had a bad day, a bad morning. But instead of interpreting that I am rude, I am angry, I am aggressive, and all of these things that come right next to me being black, instead of all of that, I would prefer that we have a conversation and we understand and recognize that these girls are coming from various and different environments and different behaviors, et cetera. Let's just give them a listening, let them express themselves, give them an ear so that suspension is not the first conversation, but listening is the only thing that we start with and then we move forward. Exactly. And that really comes from looking at an individual level, seeing individuals as individuals and not going with your default perception that is going to be based on stereotypes and it's going to be wrong absolutely absolutely well said thank you all right so now we're going to move into the next topic we have our second topic which is really focused on education engagement during and after COVID-19 so Michelle, I actually wanted to come back to you and start off with what is Girls Inc. currently doing to keep girls of color engaged and supported academically during this time? Well, you know, it's so funny that March 16 came and everything got shut down, including going to our program um, because we provide the programs in school. So we had a week to put everything together and we started our online program on March 23rd where we were providing the same program just virtually to all participants before we were providing it only to girls who were already registered with Girls Inc. But the need is so great. And we heard from so many parents and guardians who said, you know what, is it possible that my child could join? And so now we're providing the program across Westchester County. But, you know, we are spending the time providing the same program, bringing in the experts, doing all of these great things. But I must tell you, recently, we did a survey with our girls and their, their parents and their guardians. And the question was, why did you join the online program? And one of our participants responded and she said, Miss Michelle, my time with Girls Inc. daily helps me refocus. And I took that so deeply because of the fact that we know that our girls are struggling every single day. They are struggling with self-care. They are struggling with how to manage online schooling. Our seniors are struggling with the fact that they're not going to have a prom and what does this mean? And I'm going to college. Am I really going to college? All of that. But we also have our girls who are struggling with toxic relationships in the home and outside of the home. And so to hear one of our girls say, hey, this program, this time that you're giving us every day, it's really helping me to refocus because you have no idea the things that's happening when you're not present. As we continue to provide our daily programs to our girls, this summer we're going to provide summer program. We continue to engage our girls. We're working with partners like Microsoft. We're providing SAT prep and all of these opportunities for our girls because we know they need help. Going back to the fact that we are working with majority of girls of color, we know that a lot of them did not have laptops. They did not have mobile devices to even get them online. And so those are some of the things that we were able to provide and assist with and we continue to do that. But the reality is, is that these girls need respite. They're dealing with so much right now. 
and we continue to provide our online programs that help with self-esteem, help self-confidence, conflict resolution, STEM, STEAM. We have a program that is focused on redefining literacy right now because we know that we have so many of our girls who are visual learners while others are not. So, you know, not being in the classroom, not being able to have those opportunities, it's very difficult for a lot of them. And we know that some of our participants, they're the first generation and, and English is not the first language in, in the homes. So it's very difficult for them to um, be able to participate in schooling. So all of these opportunities, all of these things we're doing, we're working as much as we possibly can with individuals and school districts and, and schools that want to work with us, let me say that, because unfortunately, as an after school categorized program, it is not necessarily at the top of a school district's list to work with us daily. But we're doing our best. Thank you. And thank you for all that work that you are doing because it really is needed. And and I know just from what you're saying that there must be so many girls who are so fortunate to at least get the services that you are providing. Coronavirus has really made it very obvious how a healthy school climate and the need to be in school is very important to children, especially school age children. So I wanted to ask you in terms of school discipline practices during COVID-19, what does Greenberg have in place right now? At the Greenberg Central School District, just because we are not in school, the school builds in a brick and mortar setting, doesn't mean school is not in session. School is still in session. Therefore, the same expectations that we have for all of our students during school are the expectations we have for them while they're learning at home. That being said, some of the best practices that we continue to expect from all of our students including and especially so some of the students who have displayed behaviors that really are telling to us is that we're expected to log on every day. We're expected to check in with your teachers. We're also expected to continue with your mentorship. Just because you're not in the brick and mortar setting doesn't mean that your mentorship relationship dies or it ends. It actually continues. And so I applaud the fabulous teachers of the Greenberg Central School District for their work in that they're continuing to mentor those students who were assigned to them. They understand that that assignment is so very important to not just their academic growth, but also to their social emotional growth. Those expectations have been set well in advance of COVID-19 and they continue to happen. And what I'm finding in our school district is that you know, when we find that students are not responding to our technology program, they're not responding to remote learning, we pick up the phone and we call and we try to find out what's happening. I'm very thankful to my PPS staff, my guidance counselors, my school psychologists, and my social workers, and that they are really staying on top of children who can easily slip through the cracks during this time. And so we continue to expect that everyone at the Greenberg Central School District put their 100% into making sure that we meet the social emotional needs of our students and that we find out what's going on in their households and that we identify any sort of interventions that we can provide for our students even while we're in the COVID-19 era. And that is working successfully. I'm not going to tell you I have a perfect model because I don't, but it is working successfully and we continue to seek supports from outside agencies such as Girls Inc., such as the Westchester Department of Mental Health to come into our schools when we're working on our reopening plan to help us to continue to provide the supports that we know our kids are going to need even more so post this era that we're in right now. Fantastic. And it's so good to see the collaboration that's being done in terms of your, your staff, the psychologists, the school counselors, but also in terms of the broader community in Westchester with Girls Inc. and the Department of Community Mental Health, because again, that transition back to school is going to be a difficult one from everything I've been hearing and seeing. Josh, I have to tell you from a school perspective, I am recognized that when we come back in September, if we come back in September, notice my fingers are crossed, that I'm going to deal with students, and I say deal lovingly, who have faced trauma, who've lost family members could not give them a proper burial, proper goodbye. We have numerous families in our school district who have lost their jobs or furloughed. In fact, we created something called Greenberg Cares, where we've made donations to families so that they can continue to cope during this era while they've lost income. We prioritize, even in our school budget, the fact that we need to address the social emotional needs of our students. There's something that I've been quoting on all my social media, and that is, 
when schools are planning their reopening plan and they're devising this plan, social emotional support and health of our students have to be the central focus of any plan. Before we can reach children academically, and I know that my colleagues, Ms. Nichols and, 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 and Stephanie will speak to this as well, before we can reach the academics, we have to get into the heart of children so that they can be receptive to learning. And most of my children, I know, will have come back experiencing loss, loss of school, that sense of belonging, that feeling of being in that safe space, missing their teachers, missing their friends, the loss of loved ones, watching their parents suffer through this COVID-19, hearing of loved ones who were hospitalized and you couldn't go see them and you didn't know what was going on. Children are being bombarded with what's happening in the media and they're listening to different perspectives. And I have to tell you, it's really scary for children. And so we're gonna have to break down those barriers that children have put up just to get them to be receptive to learning and social emotional health, social emotional learning has to be every school district's first priority. It is at Greenberg. In terms of the foundation, you know, youth have to be receptive, like you were saying, to learning in order to really be fully present and engage. Out of tragic, there's also opportunities. And I actually believe that it's a wonderful time to be an educator. It's a wonderful time to be a school leader. It's a wonderful time to be a curriculum developer. Here's why. It gives you the opportunity to reflect on education as a whole. It gives you an opportunity to reflect on what's going well and what's not going well. And what's not going well is the fact that for so many years, public education has forgotten about the student's social and emotional being, right? They forgot about students' well-being. We were so concerned about test scores. We were so concerned about graduation rates. We were so concerned about so many other things other than the whole child. It allows us the opportunity to reinvent what good teaching and learning should look like. I know for me as a superintendent, it gives me the opportunity to truly implement what I believe is right for public education and for children, at least the children that I service. I know the children that I service are going to need social emotional learning. They're going to need that. Whether these kids did not face trauma or not, everyone's gonna to need to have that experience, right? And it really just a set of tools that we're teaching students so that they can cope later on as adults. And it allows us the opportunity to fix what's wrong in public education and implement what we believe is right for all children so they can grow up to be healthy, strong and adults who can contribute to our society. I really identify with that in terms of this being an opportunity as well as it is tragic, but it is also an opportunity to really move forward yeah. in an innovative type of way. Trying to look at the whole child, like you said, is so important. Absolutely. There is so much more need at this point that is still unmet. And that's really where I wanted to ask you, Stephanie, as well. What are some of the most requested services that you at Student Advocacy are seeing in relation to COVID-19? So in relation to COVID-19, we're seeing the similar request for our services in particular. Students who are struggling with attendance problems, behavior problems. And when I look back at the data from the pause starting at March 16th, number one call was about a placement issue for a student. Michelle picked up on the cultural and emotional and financial needs of these young girls. We see that all the time and we anticipate that that's going to be even more prevalent and needs to be addressed on a much greater scale for all girls uh, when they do return to school. We advocate very strongly with whatever table we're at with a student for a trauma-informed approach and clearly now that is going to be the approach that should be taken by all people who work with young girls in conversation, in school, in life, because they are carrying a lot of responsibility and a lot of the trauma that they themselves are going through or that their families are going through pre-COVID. And it's going to be greater because we do know that communities of color are four times more affected by COVID than families who are living in different communities. So that's something that I think that cultural sensitivity is going to be critical to the re-engagement of girls in school. Now, particularly some questions we are getting, which we 
may or may not be doing necessarily advocacy on, but trying to provide information that student advocacy always does are about devices and Wi-Fi and online and how do I get online and how do I get it if I can't get online? So yes, we're hearing that. We're definitely hearing that. But we're also hearing things like my child won't participate online, which speaks to a child's ability to learn in different platforms. And not some children are doing great online and some children are doing miserably online. Regents exam is going to look really different in New York this year. Of course, the number one question I think we're getting, when is school going to reopen? And of course, we don't know the answer to that, but we would like to know, but we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. So with respect to special education, which student advocacy handles a lot of special education matters across Westchester County, we're hearing questions, what's my annual review going to look like? My program review, am I going to get school year? Some of these things are required by the IEP. What are my related services going to look like? Am I going to get compensatory education? Am I going to be compensated for all of the services that are IEP mandated that I missed? Believe it or not, we're still getting suspensions. We're getting registration questions. And of course, anticipating due to the housing instability and the financial insecurity that there might be some registration and residency questions going forward into the school year. In terms of needs for transitioning back to school, we're going to strongly advocate for a trauma-informed approach, solutions, and not suspensions of girls of color and of all children in Westchester, because that is not going to solve the problem. We will only teach children how not to attend school. Thank you. And now we're going to transition back to Stephanie for our third topic of this panel. What are some school discipline solutions for Westchester? Student advocacy has long worked on a problem called solutions, not suspensions in Westchester County. And one of the primary ways to engage the students, the community, school community and the parents and, and the broader community is to take a look at your code of conduct code of conduct should be for the entire community and not only for those suspended. There should be an expectation that all children who attend school can do so with dignity and honor and respect for each other, for school, and that they have the parents all work in collaboration to ensure that this happens. And this would be first seen in the code of conduct. By rewriting the code of conduct with a restorative approach, to discipline as opposed to a punitive approach to discipline would certainly be an ambitious project, but would be the first step in taking a real hard look at how students are going to be engaged and how we're going to change school policies and practices around suspension. Of course, we would advocate all um, interactions should be from a trauma-informed perspective that will support learning. In the film, they spoke a lot about trauma in the ACEs study, and this is something we've been working with for years at Student Advocacy, understanding the impact of trauma on young girls and young boys in school. Other things that we would think would be very helpful would be to really think of school as a celebration of life and a place where students can not only learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, but learn how to be part of their community. And by rewriting the code of conduct, using a trauma-informed approach, and instilling these values in our young students in Westchester, it will only better our ability to have kids access their learning. That is so important in terms of the code of conduct. We've seen Westchester Children's Association, too, that as part of the solutions on suspensions, conversations, and even with the youth justice work that we're doing, that that's an important part, the code of conduct for kids involved with the justice system as well. And, and we're talking about the school to prison pipeline and the criminalization of black girls. And so this code of conduct is key for many different aspects of education, not just for students at risk of suspension, but also students who might not even be in school, but need to access their education in different ways. Stephanie, what sorts of positive things are you seeing in school discipline across Westchester? And is there anything that you think is working well in Westchester? When student advocacy is working on a particular student, not in a systemic way, we're able to work out what we call stipulations or settlements in the school district to minimize the out-of-school time. Any minimization of out-of-school time, in our opinion, is a win-win for students. So to be able to work collaboratively with the school district, address what the needs of the students are, and look at punishment in a restorative way, 
versus a punitive way is what we're attempting to do every single suspension that we work with the students. We also are trying very hard to make sure that the requirements of due process are followed when students are in fact suspended and that soft suspensions are not taking place anymore. So very often, very well-meaning people will say, well, it's much better if you just pick up your kid or should we suspend them? And it sounds a little harsh, but typically a formal suspension will invoke due process requirements and documentation that an informal suspension won't. So these are the ways we're trying to use the law and the community and what's in the best interest of children and the literature to try to have an impact. Thank you. And that's something that I remember watching in the movie Push Out where they were talking about the importance of public accountability and intersectionality and working together across partners, across fields, across specific areas in Westchester and and across the country. And I think that's something that Student Advocacy, Girls Inc. of Westchester and, and the Greenberg School District are all doing is trying to build those partnerships to best meet the needs of girls of color and prevent the overuse of suspensions and all of the potential issues that follow that. And Michelle, getting back to what Stephanie had just said about these positive signs, I wanted to know from you about positive youth development, and that's something that Girls Inc. of Westchester uses consistently. Um, How does that change the reality of school discipline, school outcomes for girls of color, both on an individual level, but also on a systemic level? Stephanie mentioned towards the end, she mentioned the best interests of the children. And I think when we say that, we really need to mean it, right? Anything that we are putting forward, when we're saying it's in the best interest of the children, then we need to think about the impact that it's going to have on the children, but we also need to be respectful and give them a voice. You know, how Girls Inc. Westchester has been so successful over 160 years of working with the girls and working with school districts, et cetera, is that we have been doing this thing called listening. We have been listening to the girls, understanding what's really going on with them and listening to our partners, um, our school partners, school districts to see how can we bring it all together, right? We often are saying positive reinforcements and this is all great. We're bringing in mentors. You know, I'm an advocate. I'm I'm a mother of a child. I'm of color. My child is of color and I'm a leader of color. And we're talking about all of this, but the reality for us is that we need to ensure that we are listening to our girls. We are listening to our children because they can share even more on what is happening. Take, for example, how we are looking at COVID right now. As adults, we're seeing all of these things are happening, but are we paying attention and listening to all of the things that are also happening with our children? Youth development, individually talking one-to-one with these girls, you know that there are things that are happening with them. But how do we fix it? Let's start thinking about how we know they need help. What are some of those opportunities? It is not suspension. It could be that they need help dealing with home situations. They need help with the assistance on assignments. The reason that they're probably not signing into the program is because they don't understand and they don't feel as though anybody's helping them. So we just have to spend some time really kind of listening. And we as adults, we talk about the importance of respect. We want to be respected. We also have to respect our young people and understand that if we work with them one-to-one, we will see that change. If we understand what is going on with them one-to-one, we are able to impact because I think to kind of go back to something that was mentioned in the documentary about every girl is coming with their own journey. There are things that impacted them before they even got to you. Take that into consideration. Let's not judge them. Take it into consideration and let's work together to find real creative solutions. So yes, as we are thinking about how do we help them, let's reevaluate the code of conduct. As Stephanie mentioned, let's reevaluate that. Let's put situations and think about the trauma that they're going through right now. Let's bring it all to the table because everything before COVID was one thing. Now we're here, everything has changed. 
So we need to really reassess. And again, going back to listening and respecting our young people, knowing that once we can start doing that and impacting them at that level, you will see the positive changes. Those things need to happen so that the bigger change can happen. But if we are not really focusing on them in that way, honestly, I, I don't see how that's going to work. And I, I see the positives. I see the positive. I know that, you know, Dr. Chase in her role has been doing a lot of work. And she's been listening. She's been very active. And we want some superintendents and school officials to continue doing that. We want our partners like student advocacy to continue standing in the fight when they see that there is an issue stand in the fight and say, hey, we are here to advocate. And Girls in Westchester is going to continue to do that. We are going to continue to give girls the voices that they need. And we are going to continue to advocate on their behalf as much as we can, because we know at the end of the day, if we can give them those opportunities, those tools, these girls will blossom into the leaders that we know they can be. Thank you, Michelle. And I like what you said too, connecting the individual level to the systemic level and saying, you can't have systemic outcomes, solutions that change on a very broad level without listening, without doing these things for individual girls. It really is a practice that has to be applied across the board in order to have a far-reaching outcome. Absolutely. My last question is about positive learning environments. What kinds of things can educators do to keep girls of color in positive learning environments and away from school discipline? I talked a little bit earlier about mentorships, and I've also heard my colleagues speak about that as well. The importance of mentorship, we sometimes take for granted that mentor-mentee relationship, and it's a strong relationship. Schools have to be about relevance and relationship. Relevance and making learning relevant to children so that they can retain what it is that they've learned and make it real for them, and then the relationship building. And so the relationship with the mentor-mentee is one tool that I must say that is going to be so important in helping girls to develop and grow. I take pride at being a mentor. I've mentored girls since I was an educator 26 years ago, and I still do that. And that's the stuff I love. And everyone says to me, well, you're a superintendent. How do you get to do that? You make time for it because it's probably one of the most important parts of my job. This is the reason why I dress a certain way. This is the reason why I carry myself a certain way, because I know girls are looking at me and I want to demonstrate behaviors that I think girls should emulate. I'm far from perfect. But as a professional and as a professional woman of color, I service girls who look like me and I would like for girls to grow up to be better than me. And I want them to have jobs that are greater than mine. I want girls to be able to carry themselves like young ladies. I want girls to learn from my examples of when I didn't do right or where I may have failed at something and they can learn from my mistakes and I'm always willing and, and happy to share with them and how I overcame them. So mentorship moving forward is going to be so important to our girls and to the development of our girls and mentorship can speak to their academic development as well as their social emotional development and i think what it does it encourages self-esteem it encourages girls to have courageous conversations about what they're experiencing and they can work with an adult that they can trust and that they can care for and that they can count on that's so important. And on a personal note, I really appreciate you saying that. And I know too, from my work with Westchester Children's Association, the importance of relationships, especially with youth and connection, keeping them connected to important role models, important developmental tools like education are so key in terms of the rest of their lives, in terms of cultivating good habits and a skill set. So I'm really grateful to you for saying that and adopting that. And, and through your experience, 26 years of education, I think you really have a great perspective and I wanna thank you for that. Thank you for allowing this platform to have these conversations. And I have to say through this platform, I was able to meet Ms. Nichols from Girls Inc. And I look forward to collaborating with her and seeing how she can help me. It's amazing when you can bring a community together to work with our children and help to cultivate and develop our kids. So thank you for this platform. Thank all three of you for a wonderful panel. If you have questions or would like more information, please contact me. My name is Josh Prywest. I'm the Program and Policy Associate at Westchester Children's Association. I would be glad to connect you with any of the panelists if you have specific questions for them, or if you want to learn more about how you can help Westchester's children in our work across Westchester County. I am here and I'm ready to help.
thank you all for tuning into this important conversation. We really appreciate your time and your incredible contributions and the work that you're doing outside of this panel makes all the difference. Equally, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be present here to share with you, my fellow panelists, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your experience, your knowledge. Uh, together, we are doing all that we can to continue the conversation. And we're just so grateful for all of the other individuals who are stepping up. We are additionally grateful for all of the individuals who are stepping up and being on the front line every single day, as we know that our children today need so many of the services that we individually as organizations are continuously providing. I know I'm personally grateful to the Westchester Children's Association, Allison Lake and her team, yourself, Josh, for giving us this opportunity. And we look forward to continuing the work and continuing uh, to do whatever we can to ensure that our children are taking care of every step of the way. Our future leaders, we need to take care of them today. So again, I thank the Westchester Children's Association for putting together this important panel. I think now more than any other time, it is important to talk about the well-being of our children. You know, there's a West African village that instead of greeting each other by saying hello, the greeting is, how are the children? When the children are well, we are well. And so we have an obligation, a moral obligation, to make sure that all of our children are well. And so I think this panel served that purpose in giving us the tools to go back to our respective positions and to do even more for the sake of our children. When we invest in our children, we're investing in the future. And so I think that's what this panel has served and it has really taught me a great deal. Some things I need to put in place as a school superintendent to ensure that we're listening to our children through their behaviors. The behavior should not be punitive in manner in terms of how we deal with those behaviors, but understand that our children are calling out because they need us and they need for us to hear them loud and clear. I thank you all again and I thank my fellow panelists for their expertise. They were amazing and I look forward to more discussions, equally looking forward to making sure that we implement all that was discussed today. Thank you. And I too so appreciate being able to have this very important conversation and thank Allison Lake and Westchester Children's Association for bringing this very critical conversation to the forefront. And I look forward to collaborating with schools, with other agencies, with students and parents, and try to foster understanding and compliance with the rules of conduct, procedures, state and federal laws and regulations on behalf of every single member of a school community to ensure that we're all ready to participate in the learning and are treated equally and respectfully in schools. Thank you again. So thank you all for taking the time to be here with us. Again, we should keep this conversation going. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the Westchester community to continue. And I'm speaking too to the audience that's watching this. If you have questions or anything, please reach out and I can connect you with our panelists or also with more information on how to get involved. So thank you again. I hope everyone is safe and well during this time.